All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Erica Eiderhoven. I'm here to talk to you about my State House update, um, just to let you know what's been going on in the Massachusetts State House this past week. Um, and so we're just going to go through sort of the issues that they've talked through um, and worked out um, in the State House, and we will kick it right off. So first things first, um, it's good to just kind of ground our discussion around um, let's see, move back. Um, that we are currently 30 days into the state of emergency that was issued by Charlie Baker. Um, so it's been 30 days since we've been in that state of emergency, a little less time um, since the schools were closed, but essentially that's uh, just to ground us that this is, you know, it's been a full month and it's interesting to see what the Massachusetts State House has done um, during these 30 days and what we expect them to do uh, moving forward. So. Without further ado, these are the three issues that um, the State House worked on this week. Um, and I'll give you an update on each one. Unfortunately, it's not that they all became bills, just to be clear, these are just the three um, issues that were tackled in the State House. So um, the three issues that pertain to COVID-19 include uh, the MCAS being canceled. So that's the, one of the good things that happened this week. Two, um, some updates on the housing bill around pauses for evictions and foreclosures. And finally, uh, we need to start looking into this, but you know, especially with election season coming up in September, you know, election laws and particularly for ballot access for candidates. So I'll elaborate more on that in a few minutes. So to start us off, some of the good news that we've seen from the State House, which I'm very excited to share, is that the Senate voted on a stronger bill with stronger language that will outright cancel the MCAS, which is a huge victory um, that MCAS is definitely canceled this year. Um, just to update you from last week, um, unfortunately, the House voted on a version that did not outright cancel the MCAS. Um, and so it was sort of leaving the can, you know, sort of kicking the can down the road as to what the State House, you know, what when we would get any sort of clarity for students around whether there will be an MCAS exam this year. But the Senate voted on a much stronger language. And so we will see um, what happens next with that bill. But that is a huge victory for us, um, given that the Senate has uh, sided. Um, in favor. And I just wanted to give a little shout out also to Senator Pat Jalen. She has been a incredible champion for educational issues, uh, particularly for the unions and our public schools. Um, and she came out before the vote uh, took place around the MCAS in favor of canceling it. And so um, really appreciate her hard work on pushing for this. Um, we've also heard, I don't have a tweet or anything to um, show on this, but Jason Lewis, uh, who is the chair of ed education on the Senate side, was also very supportive of canceling the MCAS. So thanks to the two senators, um, plus you know other senators who were supportive of this, that we were able to get this past the finish line. Um, so I just want to you know underline this is where a great example of where organizing gets the goods. Um, this is a huge victory for teachers unions as well as for an organization called Citizens for Public Schools. They do amazing work around addressing the issue with high stakes testing in our state. Um, and they made a huge call for action. We actually had had a live stream with the MTA earlier on Sunday. Um, and we've heard from folks in the state house that you know they were getting calls nonstop this week around MCAS. And as a result, MCAS has been canceled. And so this is just a great example of how external pressure, grassroots pressure from the ground up um, can fight for the changes we need to see. And this is definitely something um, for anyone who has students uh, in our public school systems. I mean, this is an enormous uh, hang up for people on not having clarity about what's going to happen with the MCAS exams this year. So we're very excited that we won this victory. And I should also share that I'm in favor of canceling the MCAS altogether. I believe I support a bill that would put a moratorium on a high stakes testing. Um, unfortunately, that bill this year was sent to study, but it is something that I'm happy to fight uh, for because I do think that high stakes testing is incredibly harmful to our students. They in reinforce structural racism in our schools, um, as well as um, they are a terrible way to assess uh, students. The only thing that we've seen the MCAS measure over the years is what zip code uh, you live in. Uh, and also what your income level is. So we're very excited to see the, can the cancellation of MCAS this year. And I think we need to organize and push for a cancellation of MCAS altogether. Um, the second piece that the House uh, did some work on and the Senate did some work on, which I'll update you. Unfortunately, there isn't anything definitive yet on this, but there is the pause on evictions and foreclosures. 
So as just to update and to recap from last week, the House voted on a pretty decent bill that would pause evictions and foreclosures from now until 30 days after the state of emergency is lifted. Um, in terms of the House bill, the one hang up I have on that bill is that I don't think 30 days after the state of emergency is enough time for people to pay back rent. So if the state of emergency lasts five months, um, to have to make up all five months of payments and rents over the course of one month is nearly impossible for most people. So I'm in favor of a bill that would extend um, that period of time to at least as long as a state of emergency took place. So if we have four months of a state of emergency that um, renters and, and uh, mortgage payers will be able to pay back over a, a period of time rather than having to pay it all back in 30 days or have some sort of graduated schedule um, on paying back. So I think that's my biggest critique of the House bill that came out last week. Um, unfortunately, like I said, the Senate has not really made a decision on this yet and they will be voting on it uh, supposedly on Monday. So that'll be very exciting to see what happens. But so far, um, I wanna point out sort of the three important pieces of this bill. Um, and then I'll walk through what is the difference between the House and Senate version and what version that I'm supporting. Um, and so the three important pieces are around, one, the landlord's ability to send notices to tenants to leave. That is a really critical part that um, City Life or uh, Vida Urbana has been pushing for. Um, it's essentially regulations around whether landlords can send notices to their tenants, because that's a huge part of how evictions happen, whether lawfully or not. Um, a second piece is around the exceptions. So there are some exceptions where you could get evicted or you could get foreclosed on. And so we'll go through those exceptions and what which bill I favor on that point. And finally, the duration of the moratorium, which is what I just discussed around um, the amount of time that tenants or mortgage payers have until they have to pay back their um, back paid payments. So that's another piece that we want to look out for. So I'll go through each of these three aspects of the bill and um, just show you what's the kind of the difference between the, the two House and Senate version. Um, first. Um, both the House and the Senate versions is a good part. They are very clear on the fact that landlords cannot send notices to tenants requesting them to leave. So that's a really important piece that um, the advocates, housing advocates have been pushing for. It is clear in both versions of the bill that that is there, which is great. Um, the piece that is unclear is around the, the exceptions for landlords to evict tenants. I believe the House version is a lot cleaner. There's really only two exceptions where you can be um, foreclosed or evicted. One is if there's some sort of criminal activity or two, if there are clear lease violations um, detrimental to the health and, health and safety of residents. So the house really lays out clearly, like those are the only conditions at which you can evict or foreclose on someone. Um, unfortunately, the Senate version is a little less clear and it's unclear what it means like non-essential evictions. Um, and so I would like the Senate to adopt the house version of that language around just making it very clear that these are the only two cases um, where someone can get evicted or foreclosed on. Um, and then coming back to that point that I think is, is incredibly important, which is the amount of time people have to pay back their rent or mortgage payments. Um, so just to compare and contrast the house and Senate versions, and to be clear, I support a longer period than both, but the Senate version only has 120 days from today. Um, and there is a part of it that says, you know, well, they will li let the governor extend that um, to, you know, state of emergency plus 30 days if necessary. But again, that's a lot weaker than what the House has. The House version says tenants only have 30 days after the state of emergency to pay outstanding rent or mortgage payments. Um, and my belief is that that time period should be longer. But if I had to pick between the House and Senate version, the House version is stronger because 120 days from today means that they'll have to revisit it again later if the state of emergency extends past 120 days. Um, and so I would prefer to see some sort of um, clarity around, okay, when the state of emergency is lifted, how much time do people have to pay back their rents and mortgage payments? Um, all right, and um, I just wanna share a little bit too about uh, conference committee because right now, because there's a difference between the house version of a bill and the Senate version of this foreclosure, um, moratorium of foreclosures and evictions bill, um, this is an example of where a bill can be taken into what's called conference committee. And so I just wanted to share a few words on what that means. Um, and essentially, the simple one liner around conference committee is it's where um, it is one method by which the House and the Senate can resolve differences in their bills. Um, you can see my little graphic on the right there. Um, you know, the House makes up 160 members or the Senate with 40 members. They each vote on bills. And if a version that they upvote a bill on is different between the House and the Senate, 
conference committee is one way for them to resolve those differences. And so I just pointed out to you earlier about those differences. We're going to see how those differences play out in the next week when they meet in conference committee. Um, and conference committee is a very small number of reps and senators. There's only three House reps and three senators who make up the conference committee. And they're often chosen by the um, Senate president and the Speaker of the House. Um, and most often, I mean, with a few exceptions, it is uh, it usually includes from both the House and the Senate, the chair of Ways and Means, the chair of the relevant committee. So in this case, it's the housing chair. Um, and then usually one Republican. So there's always, you know, two out of six are Republican, two out of six are Ways and Means chair on the House and Senate side, and two out of the six uh, members of the conference committee are from the chair of the relevant committee. So just to give an example, um, you know, Kev, Rep, Representative Kevin Honan is coming from the housing committee side. So he will be in this conference committee. So we should be turning to him to see what kind of uh, bill they come out with out of conference committee because it is really resting in his hands. Um, as well as Senator Crichton is the um, housing committee on the Senate side. And then you've got the Ways and Means chairs and two Republicans. So um, right now that bill on the moratorium for foreclosures and evictions is going to be in this conference committee. Those six people will meet um, and decide what they're going to do about this bill, which version of the bill they will take up. Um, and our hope is that between the six of them, they will choose the most progressive bill possible where there is enough time for people to pay back their rents. Um, there's a lot of clarity on what those exceptions are when people can be evicted. And um, there is also just clarity around um, the Senate, you know, well, I guess the last, first point around the Senate and the House already agree that you, know, you cannot send notices to kick tenants out. And so um, those are the things that we'll be looking for in the next week of this bill. It's a much needed bill because as everyone knows, it's been 10 days since rent was due in April. Um, so many of the people who are unemployed right now had to pay this month's rent. Um, we really need to see this bill pass. Uh, by May. Otherwise, a lot of people are going to be on the hook for two months of rent now since a lot of people have had to stop working due to this COVID-19 crisis. Um, and then the last point I want to share is around signatures for getting on the ballots for candidates. So um, currently, if you're running for office, you need to collect a certain number of signatures to get on the ballot. In my case, for running for state representative, I needed to collect 150 signatures to get on the ballot. Now I should say, um, just to share with all my supporters and um, people on my campaign, I have collected over, I think about 450 signatures that have been already submitted to City Hall in Somerville. I'm waiting for Somerville City Hall to send them back to me, but they have told me that they will be sending back my signatures. So um, I'm in very good shape in terms of getting on the ballot because all these signatures have been sent to City Hall. Now I need to bring them to the Commonwealth, uh, Secretary of the Commonwealth. And I fortunately just did not have to collect signatures during this COVID crisis because I had collected them um, by, I think early March is when we submitted it. Um, and so this is not a current issue for my campaign, but it is an issue for many candidates. Um, I speak to many candidates across the state. I believe everyone should have the right to be on the ballot. And so um, this is a really critical issue because currently, if you wanna run for office and be on the ballot, in the midst of the COVID crisis, you need to collect to run for state rep 150 signatures when we're supposed to be socially distancing. Um, and so this puts both, you know, candidates for office at risk, it puts their supporters and voters at risk. Um, I know the Ed Markey campaign is struggling to get the number of signatures needed because the threshold is much higher for federal office. Um, so this is a huge issue in terms of protecting the integrity of our democracy, ensuring that people are, who want to be on the ballot can get on the ballot without putting the you know health their health or safety at risk. Um, and it turns out, you know, it's there is a bill right now in the House um, that is trying to reduce the number of candidate signature requirements by one third of their current requirements. So in my case, instead of having to collect 150 signatures in order to get on the ballot, you would only have to collect 50 signatures if this bill became law. Um, I should also mention that the deadline for getting on the ballot is coming up. It's at the end of April. Um, and so there's some, this is something that the House and the Senate really need to move quickly on if they want to see some changes. And the Secretary of the Commonwealth have made, has made very clear that it needs to come from the legislature. Um, it is not something that, you know, Senate, um, Secretary Galvin can decide on his own. Um, and so this is a huge struggle, right, for many, for many campaigns. Um, and I am supportive of reducing that number of um, signature requirements. It, 
for the sake of our safety. Um, I should also mention that a lot of young people tend to be the people who, you know, collect signatures for them to put themselves at risk right now is not great. Um, and so I was so that the, the things that I like about this bill that has been filed, one, um, you know, candidates won't have to collect as many signatures, collecting 50 from my race will be incredibly reasonable. Um, and two, um, the, the side that is unfortunately not as great is that this is only for candidates running for office. It does not include ballot questions. Um, and there are some amazing ballot questions that are being organized right now by 350, by Act on Mass around transparency rules. And they still need to collect a certain number of signatures to put questions on the ballot. Um, and so that is something really important that unfortunately they did not include in the bill. I would have preferred to, for them to reduce the number of signatures required both for candidates and ballot questions, but unfortunately that's not the case. But in any case, I would like to see this uh, bill move forward. It is really important uh, for the integrity of our democracy that people who want to run can get on the ballot. Um, and we'll have to see if the House or the Senate take up this bill. Um, but unfortunately, there hasn't been a lot of movement on it. There has been a lawsuit filed by a number of candidates saying this is unsafe um, for us to campaign right now. Um, so, you know, definitely, you know, look out. I know that the, you know, there's been changes in the presidential election. Um, Bernie Sanders has dropped out. Um, but there are so many down ballot races to be concerned about. And so making sure that you help um, your local candidates get on the ballot is really important, um, given that for now, they're not changing the signature requirement. Um, and if that still stands, it's a lot of work. And I've been in touch with many candidates who are rushing to get on the ballot. And it's a lot um, to get 150 signatures when we're not supposed to be in close contact. So um, this is just an issue that I wanted to raise. Unfortunately, all that's happened so far is that a bill has been filed. There has not been a vote. Um, all we know is that Governor Baker and Senate President Karen Spilka are in favor of lowering the signature requirements, and we haven't heard anything from Speaker DeLeo. So I think it's very important that we push our representatives to change this, particularly in these coming weeks, because there is only two weeks left for people to get on the ballot. And if they lower this signature requirement, it'll make a huge difference for a lot of campaigns. So um, that is it for my State House update. Thank you all so much for tuning in this week and look out for next week. I will be doing these weekly updates for you know 15 to 30 minutes on issues. I'm just gonna check real quick if there are any comments, which I don't see any questions right now. But if you have any questions around what happened in the State House this week, what's my position on any of these issues, um, feel free to reach out either by email at erica at electerica.com. You can also go to my website at www.electerica.com or feel free to comment on Facebook, direct message me on Twitter, um, that's Erica for rep or elect Erica. So great having you all here. Thanks to everyone who tuned in. Um, and very excited to see you all next week. Take care.